Let's pray. God, thank you for the ways in which you reveal yourself to us. Help us to take the time to make the effort to catch those glimpses. Help these words today to be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know about you, but to me there is nothing more peaceful than a newborn infant when they're sleeping. So I found a couple pictures for you. I know you don't need them. I know you know what I'm talking about, but I found a couple of pictures. Look at that face. Look at, let's see the next one. And our last sleeper. <laughs> Is that great? That's serenity. That's serenity and that's comfort and that's peace and that's joy all in one. Well, we also know that babies aren't always peaceful and serene. We're aware of that. They also grow up into uh, kids who can have a hard time sitting still. I don't know about you, but I have vivid recollections. Two events stand out. I don't know how old I was. Six? Maybe? Seven? And I remember there were two events. One was, I think, a recital or a concert. There were stringed instruments involved. And the other, I really don't know. It wasn't church, but it was something. And in both situations, we were like in the front row or next to the front row, so I couldn't like slip out and do something else. And I remember the, I remember how like it was almost physical agony to like sit there and, ah, uh, and it seemed like it was 18 hours long, not combined, each one. So if there are kids today here, are there any who have a hard time uh, sitting still for long periods of time? All right. I understand. I'm one of you. I'm one of you. Hard, hard to uh, stay still. And when you think about it, if you're looking at your kid when you uh, when we're talking about that, it just makes you think, where do they get that from? Hmm. Hmm. If you're like a lot of people, you're going, 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 going all the time. And that's just Paul here at your church. But it could be meetings, it could be your job, it could be the job you do, you have to do when you come home from your job. Like I said, there are meetings, there are responsibilities, there are appointments, there are commitments. It's catching Pokemon characters with your phone. It's busy, it's very busy out there. It's also noisy. We've just come through two uh, conventions and there's a lot of yelling, there's lots of cheering, there's lots of protest, and then there's lots of commentators talking about the talkers who talked at the convention. Noisy, it's very noisy. And it's also scary out there. Pick your city. I'm, you could pick lots more than I'm going to mention. San Bernardino, Nice, Baton Rouge, Dallas, and here, in safe and calm and secure Santa Clarita, we have fires burning up 18 homes and killing a person. Scary. If there was ever a time to read Psalm 46, it's now. So I invite you to, you already heard the words, I invite you to turn to them. Psalm 46. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 and 10. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. 
I will be exalted in the earth. These words are full of comfort and encouragement, but I think there are eight of them that ought to make us think a little bit. And those eight words are the ones that when we asked, when we were uh, getting together this morning at the end of Sabbath school, I asked, where's Alexander? I asked, we asked everybody, do you have a favorite Bible verse? And without knowing what I'd be looking at today, she says, oh, it's this one. Eight words, be still and know that I am God. Let's face it, when we are busy, 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 and when our lives get noisy, and when unsettling things are happening, it's easy to forget that God is still God. And we're not the only ones who can forget that from time to time. I want us to look at two stories, and the first is found in 1 Kings 19. But before we jump into chapter 19, you have to understand what just happened in chapter 18. This is Elijah, and I'm going to try to uh, condense this very quickly to set some context, but really I'm not going to do it justice, so pick some time out today or this weekend and go read these two chapters together. In 18, you have Elijah who is trying to be faithful to God's commands to keep God's people turned toward him, and you have a series of uh, kings who don't really, aren't really interested in that, or a people who's halfway in and halfway out. So much so that they say they worship God, but they also worship Baal. So in chapter 18, Elijah says, I'm going to meet with the king, tell all their prophets, the prophets of Baal, let's have, it, let's have this out once and for all. You call on your God, build an altar, I'll call on Jehovah, whichever one, whichever offering is accepted, follow that God. And I think you, if you've ever heard the story, you know what happens. 450 priests do a lot of uh, invoking, chanting, and, I, and Elijah is sort of get, even gets to the place where he's taunting him a little bit. Maybe your God's sleeping. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. Maybe he's doing something. Keep doing it louder, though. You'll get it. After they play themselves out, he says, put some water on my altar. P put it on some again. Put it on again. And he says, he calls on God. Fire comes down, accepts the offering, burns it all up. It's a remarkable manifestation of God's presence. That's what happens in 18. There's more that happens. But then in 19, we'll pick it up and we'll read it to verse 18. So in 1 Kings 19, now I should tell you that the king is Ahab, seems like a kind of weak uh, person. But his wife was not weak. She was strong. And once she heard, by the way, the detail I left out, I'm not trying to keep it PG-13, but the detail I left out is those 450 priests, uh, Elijah said, don't let those guys get away, and they were slaughtered. So once that news gets back to Jezebel, she says, okay, she, she invokes this curse that says, hey, be it something if, you're, if you don't end up like those prophets that you just had eliminated. Wow, okay, so 19. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. The earlier verse doesn't say he actually did it, but it still happened. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Interesting what happens next. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Is that what you would have expected at that moment? When, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went another day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Surprising. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under a tree and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, 
for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, he ate and he drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into the cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah answered him, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper, or in some translations, a still, small voice. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. He says the same thing he said the first time. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jezu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elijah will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him." In a still, small voice, God asked one of the greatest prophets of all time, what are you doing? What are you doing? Then he tells him to go anoint the guy who is going to take over, take his job. And then he sets the record straight. I think in a loving way, he says, I know where you're at. You're tired, you're worn out. But let me just be clear, you're not the last one. There are others, and I'm still here. Be still and know that I am God. Our next story is the one you heard in Scripture, and it should be pretty familiar to you as well. There are several tellings of this uh, instance, but I like the language in Mark best. So that's what we're going to look at. So Mark, let's see, Mark chapter 4, verses... 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was, in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you afraid? Why do you still have no faith? Disciples were terrified about this and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Imagine being in either one of those stories when amazing things are happening to you. By the way, this isn't the first, this would not have been the first thing that would have been supernatural that the disciples would have seen. So let's think about this. How, if you're Jesus, how do you get to the place where you're so tired 
that you can sleep through a storm that's that violent. I have a theory. It's that when you have devoted your life to giving all that you are and everything that you have to anyone else, it exhausts you. He came so that he could give himself entirely to us, and it's exhausting. So he gets in a boat, and it didn't matter if it was rough and stormy. He was sleeping. So did you catch what was in the way that the disciples asked him? They get him up. Instead of letting him sleep, they get him up, and what do they ask him? In this, in Mark says, don't you care about us? <laughs> so we are, we are, we're already exhibiting that we don't care enough about you to let you sleep. We need you to answer why you're not caring about our situation right now. Which makes me wonder, although Mark is pretty clear that he's telling waves and wind to be still, who do you think he might have also been saying that to? Chill. Just settle down. Settle down. Be still and know that I am God. In this story, Jesus, it's kind of flipped from the other one, Jesus sets the record straight. In case they didn't know, he has dominion over the elements. Then, in so many words, he asks his disciples, what are you doing? Why don't you have any faith in who I am? There are similarities, aren't there? Both Elijah and the disciples were overwhelmed by tumultuous things that were happening to them. And both seemed to forget the power of God, even though they had already had previous manifestations of it. Just like we do. And in both cases, God had to remind them, I've got this. I've got your back, and you're not alone. Elijah felt like he was in danger, so did the disciples. But when they stepped into the stillness, they encountered a deliverer who was mightier than the enemy who was chasing them or than the storm that threatened them. So this morning, are we running scared? It's okay. We're not alone. Are we being buffeted by winds and waves that are overwhelming us? It's okay. We're not alone. Does it seem like God isn't doing enough to solve our problems? It's okay. We're not alone. The problem is, as I mentioned before, that many of us have a hard time being still. When's the last time you stopped and looked at a beautiful flower? Do you have your bulletin? When you just stopped and looked at a flower, like the one that's on our cover, just to look at it and contemplate its design. When was the last time, apart from however few minutes ago, we saw those great sleeping babies, you really just looked into a newborn infant's face and marveled at God's creativity? In our busy, noisy, and sometimes scary lives, we don't take the time to find the stillness. But we're going to do something about that this morning. We're going to spend a moment. It might be uncomfortably longer than you're used to, but we are going to spend a moment in stillness together here in God's presence. And there are only two instructions. Be still and know that God is God, and they're His instructions.
That's a good start. It's not enough. The rest you get to exercise when you leave here. There's one more aspect of stillness that I want to leave you with this morning. In college, I took a Life and Teachings of Jesus class from Dr. Charles Teal. And Dr. Teal is great. And he got me to think about things about Jesus and the Bible that I'd never noticed before. And another thing he would do is he would put ness, N-E-S-S, on the words that don't normally take it, like kingdom ness. And he had this gesture that he'd do, kingdom ness. So I want to borrow Dr. Teal's device this morning to help us appreciate that God is a God of stillness. When we are unlovable, God loves us still. When we are going through struggles, God is our refuge still. When nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall, He is our strength still. When the oceans roar and the mountains burn, He is our ever-present help still. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress still.